<clears throat> but today I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, herbicide resistant Palmer in Arizona. Uh, we started this program about a year ago or so after the recent years of explosion of Palmer amaranth just throughout our throughout central Arizona. Uh, everywhere we go, we see it. So I'm out working with our new uh, weed extension specialist, Jose Luis Diaz, and we're putting together uh, a whole extension program just to try to get this under wraps a little bit and uh, get everybody up to speed and in the same mindset to control Palmer amaranth. So this year we we did a mapping and monitoring uh, project, which we're going to continue in future years, but it was basically to to get a resource map across the whole state of exactly what we're looking at for resource or uh, resistant Palmer population. So we did this in association with the Arizona Cotton Research and Protection Council. And we looked at every single cotton field in the whole state of Arizona. And if there was an obvious population of Palmer living in that field, we documented it, it as an infestation. And we, rate, we rated them all, but these are the numbers that we saw across the state that showed a presence of a population. We did this in August. So these weeds should all have been sprayed at least once or twice with, with uh, glyphosate. And they should, have, they should have been taken care of. Most of the, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner, when you get to a field that looks like that at the end of the season, you know, it's already too late. The, the ship has sailed on that one and you're, you're setting yourself up for a bigger problem long-term. So if you look across the state, we found um, populations of resistant weeds in every single county with cotton, except for La Paz and Yuma. Yuma had some suspect fields, but they ran into some management issues. So we did not document them for this year. We're gonna double back next year and check. Um, so we're looking at the acres, the acres on that map on the top left, uh, those are the ones that are infested in each county. Now, mind you, the, those numbers can be skewed a little bit because of the large production in particularly Pinal County and Maricopa County. Uh, the percentage of infestation is actually highest in Greenlee County, where most of the fields were documented as being infested. Uh, Pinal had one of the lowest rates. Uh, as, a, as a total, we had approximately 7% of our acres across the state infested with the resistant population. Now, what we did at the end of the season we went across all those fields when that palmer was was mature and we collected seed heads off of them and jose is actually gonna go out and grow them on the greenhouse and treat them and see if they are in fact confirm that they are in fact resistant and then see if they're also resistant to other uh, mechanisms of action other than just glyphosate so this is where your problem is uh but this is why it's a, a problem Palmer grows everywhere. It's a native plant here in Arizona uh, and we can't control it everywhere. It's just never gonna happen. But we have to try our best to control it when it's near our agricultural field so that it doesn't impact our, our economic returns long-term because right now it is. Um, we see these areas that aren't in cotton fields that are also very big players in the problem. For example, right here, you see it growing next to a roadside, next to a road, nobody's gonna disc that and it's probably not gonna get treated with any herbicide. So that's just going to be a source for, for more pollen and more seed, whether it's resistant or not. If it gets pollinated with, with uh, Palmer that is resistant, there's a good chance that you're going to get at least 25 or 50% of that population to be resistant. So we're looking at roadsides. We have lots of land that's going into uh, new communities. And you know, when they're, when they're building those new communities, they don't actually manage weeds. So they're just a breeding ground there as well. There's also other cropping situations that we did not monitor this year, but are as big of a problem as any other, and that is hay fields. As you can see here, the South Alpha field has some uncontrolled palmer on the border. Throughout the summer, that stuff takes off, and if folks aren't running borders, they just act as, as a breeding ground uh, for palmer. Uh, silage fields, corn, sorghum, any of them are on the field, field margins. They are typically not very well controlled uh, for, for palmer. Uh, so we get a, get a population on the edge and it, it gets up to maturity and spreads more and more seed. And then it just gets taken throughout the, the field uh, the next year when you're doing tillage. It's also a problem in corn stubble. So if, if you cut your corn early and then we get some rain and you get a germination event of Palmer across that field, a lot of times it doesn't get dissed under or managed in any way, shape or form until the next season. So allowing those fields just to go uncontrolled, uh, it just can't be an option moving forward. 
And then the biggest problem of all is when we run into these issues where we actually have those resisted palmer growing in a field. So it's hard enough to keep the, keep the palmer that isn't resistant managed. Then we end up here with a situation like this, where you've got, this is after being treated with glyphosate, you have a range of, of resistance in these plants. You see the plant on the right has absolutely no effects of, of herbicide damage. Plant on the left, you see some chlorosis, but it's gonna work its way through that and continue to go on. It's already got little seed heads on if you look at it close and you're gonna, you're gonna end up spreading more and more seed. <clears throat> so it's 100% control. Zero escapes is really the only way we can manage it long-term. Uh, and uh, Palmer is a male and female plant. If you look at the seed heads closely, uh, if you look at those top two pictures that the male plant, it has the little yellow pollen sacs. Um, it's also a little bit smoother. The seed heads are a little bit smoother, whereas you see the bottom is a female, the seed heads are real spiky, and you certainly know when you come into contact with them because they'll, they'll bite back a little bit. And like I mentioned earlier, when pollen moves and or, or male plants, if either of them are glyphosate resistant, you're going to end up with some glyphosate resistant seeds going into your next year's cropping system. And those numbers of seeds are just incredible. Uh, this plant is a prolific producer. Of, of seed. <clears throat> it can produce over well over a million, like this plant you see on your screen now, uh, well over a million seeds per, per plant when they're, when they're grown without competition. And that's, uh, they put out up to, in a, in a heavily infested field, you're looking at 375 million seeds per foot of row, uh, which is just incredible. When we, we'll look at some pictures later that kind of show what a, what a bad Palmer situation looks like. And you know, it just looks like a green carpet when those when you get those germination problems if you don't have any any pre-emergent uh, herbicide down. The good news is uh, it loses its viability somewhat quickly. It can go down 85% in just three years, but it does have a long-term, uh, some of that seed will stay viable in the seed bank for a long time. That 85%, you think maybe, oh, we just got to keep her batted down for, for three years and we'll be good. Uh, well, 85% loss of 375 million still leaves you with about 50 million seeds per, per foot of uh, crop row. So you're in trouble if, if you end up with a big problem even after three, five or 10 years. So it's really important to not let those females go to seed. 0% escapes. And then they, this is how they affect your crop. So they have a C4 photosynthesis pathway. They grow much, much more rapidly than your cotton plant. Uh, 2.3 is what the research tells us, but that's, uh, they, could, they all perform it, perform cotton and heat. They grow down that big tap root faster. They're sucking your nutrients away from your crop. They're sucking light away from your crop. They're sucking water away from your crop. And it just ends up uh, being really detrimental if you end up with a large infestation over, over a whole field, even a, even a part of the field. So here's, Here's some plants that germinated simultaneously with that cotton crop. So you see the cotton's up about two, maybe, maybe three leaf. And that palmer's already got three or four inches on it, growing above it and, and sucking those nutrients out. So this is why you got to get them early. Earliness is key. Some past studies have shown us exactly how these move through a field. If you look here in the bottom right-hand corner, you see in this study, they put down 20,000 seeds that were resistant. Now, if you remember back to earlier, we're looking at a million seeds, half a million to a million seeds in one large plant. So 20,000 seeds is, is nothing. After one year of growing that field with only glyphosate, uh, they had minimal impacts, minimal yield impacts, but the plants started at the head of that field, but got irrigated down to the bottom. And there was, there was some, some plants visible at the end of the season. But like I said, no impacts. After two years of growing, you got a big strip down the middle with large impacts across the field. Head of that field is completely inundated and there's a big strip going right down the middle, which looks very, very similar to that field that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. That, was, that picture was taken in uh, Casa Grande last year. So these, these problems are out there and they're showing exactly what the research showed us over, over the years. Then you go into that third year of not controlling it. When you think you had, a, when you think you had your stuff taken care of, and you end up with no cotton in that field at all. So you, uh, you really end up with huge problems, no lint, 
and uncontrollable, uncontrollable uh, infestation. So if you go from zero to a thousand in just three years, and to manage that, you really have to look at, uh, you have to take an integrated approach and use every single tool in your toolbox to, to handle it. Here's our uh, slide from our new weed scientist. He's looking at, you know, putting a whole, whole weed, uh, integrated weed management system together, using all of our tools together, tillage, spraying, cultural methods. And I don't know if we're going to train some pocket gophers to go out and eat the palmer roots or not, but uh, if there was some kind of biological control, we'd look at that as well. But we really want to look at every option we have to put this together. And there's, there are many that we actually do have in our toolbox now. Tillage and making sure, <clears throat> excuse me, making sure our fields are clean are one of the one of the key things. In season cultivation, I know a lot of folks don't like running a cultivator, but uh, it, and it's kind of got out of fashion. But relying on over the top sprays, it just isn't a, a way to do it anymore. We just don't. We just lost the access to just rely on one thing. And then hand hoeing weeds. I know that's another another difficult thing to do to talk people into doing. But if there's five, six, seven escapes out there, they need to get they need to get chopped down before they go to seed, or you're going to end up with larger problems in the immediate future. And then when you get to the chemical side of things, just rotating, rotate, 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 uh, using the new, the new and different technologies. The crops coming through, incorporating all your laybys and your uh, soil residual herbicides is just it's paramount to keeping your fields clean. <clears throat> and then using some of the other somewhat newly pioneered systems of uh, cover cropping and uh, no-till have have some great effects on keeping down those weed populations and you know monitoring and manipulating your row spacing so that your rows close faster and then you don't have as long of a window to keep those weeds at bay and then another one we look at also is planting date you get into if you're putting in replant in june you're going to end up with some big problems because you're going to have explosions of palmer with uh, side by side with with your baby baby cotton plants, and this this field here is, is funny. This is a field I was managing years ago, and the uh, sprayer exploded right at the beginning of the season, and the owner was too cheap to buy a new one. But we had a explosion in the field at monsoon season, and and just like that, you know, in a couple of weeks of not being able to control it, it totally took over. And early intervention is key, not only in the year, but in identifying uh, if you have a problem or not. And in a year, the, in, nothing earlier than using pre-emergent herbicide to start controlling that Palmer. This is a study Bill McCloskey did back in the early 2000s and using Prowl, I mean, it just works so well. Uh, you could look across and see some, you know, height differences and, and how the plants grow that didn't get killed. But if you look at that big graph on the right-hand side, that shows that tells the story of, of weed control throughout your season. If you're only having to manage two to five Palmer plants in a square meter compared to 200, uh, you're saving yourself a lot of headache. And I, I know it's another additional cost, and I, I know it's it's messy to deal with, but uh, man, it, it just works so well still in our cropping systems that uh, if you know we have a problem, there is just no alternative to putting out a little bit of pre-emergent herbicide pre-plant. And this is what it, this is what it visually looked like from that trial. You see in that the plot closest to the uh, you in the picture, that's pre-plant incorporated prowl right there working working really well. You see those few escapes, but uh, uh, not better than the plot right next to it at the far end where nothing was nothing was controlled and it's just a green carpet. <clears throat> and so really just going back and using all of those tools again getting in early, using your pre-plants, using your cultivation and tillage throughout the season and doing timely applications of your uh, chemical herbicides. And by timely, I mean looking at small plants, not when they're a foot tall, that, doesn't, that, that just <laughs> sets you up for failure, but getting in when they're small, when they're actively growing, uh, will save you a lot of headache and heartache in the long run. And uh, hopefully we can continue to build on this program and, and develop more and more of our our tactics and some more publications just to get the information out. And I know it's not everyone. As I said, there's only 7% of the state that's populated, 7% of the cotton fields in the state that have the problem. Uh, so that means there's a large percentage of those people that have a problem that's being managed. 
it's that 7% that we all need to need to get on board. Uh, so hopefully we can do that. And, and if anybody has insights on poking out some people to try to try to, you know, give them a little more information. Uh, I, I'm, I'm all ears on, on identifying how we could help certain people that, that need it. Um, and so I'd like to thank a lot of supporters, the ag industry folks here in Arizona have all helped me out financially, uh, putting this program together and getting this monitoring mapping done. Arizona cotton growers have implemented some money. Pest management center has given me some support. Um, so I just really like to thank everybody. And of course, working with the uh, cotton research and protection council to, uh, to put those maps together and figure out where all these fields are. Their, uh, their efforts are, are great and I couldn't do this without them. So thank everybody. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready.